now we are recorded. And what we're going to do now, folks, is we are going to transition into another uh, part of this webinar room. So you're going to see your um, screen kind of change around a little bit. I'll let uh, give everything a second to load up here. Uh, we'll start our webcam here in a second, but what I want to point out to you is in the bottom left hand side this area, this Q&A area. Throughout the program if you have questions for Captain Jacobs what you will do is you will type those questions inside of that Q&A area. And uh, I will be monitoring that area, jotting down your questions, and we'll save some time at the end of this program for your Q&A. And that's when I will be asking those questions on your behalf. So send those my way. I'll be watching and looking out for them. Addition, additionally, as I said, if you're having any technology issues, please also you know, send them that way as well. Since we're really truly at 11, I'm going to start up our webcam so that our audience can see the both of us. All right, so there we go. Hello, good morning, everyone out there. Thank you for joining us. It was great to see from um, you know all parts of this country, and even actually we've got some international viewers today too. So we really appreciate you spending the next hour with us um, when there's you know a lot of things going on and a lot of busy schedules. So much appreciated. Uh, before we get started, I thought I would uh, introduce Captain Jacobs here. Also, thank you so much for being here uh, with us today to um, share the story of Pearl Harbor. Um, Captain Jacobs joined the Navy in 1968. He retired in 1994 as a captain after 26 years of service on active duty and in reserve. Uh, he served in a variety of uh, ashore and afloat commands uh, and embarked admiral staff in the Mediterranean nine years in a small boat unit and elsewhere. Uh, his undergraduate degree in history is from Tulane, including a year at King's College in the Univer uh, University of London. In 1994, he graduated with distinction from the Naval War College. Uh, he has spoken on military subjects for a number of years, including over 50 talks at, uh, of course, this museum here uh, at the World War II Museum, as I mentioned to folks, um, and elsewhere. So you. Captain Jacobs actually might be a familiar face to some of our local audiences. So regardless, familiar or new, we really appreciate you being Thank here you. and sharing the story of Pearl Harbor. I'm going to wheel out of the way so you can take front and center, and I'll be answering those questions for you guys behind the scenes. Thank you, Captain Jacobs. In the 17th century, Japan became a closed kingdom, ruled by a feudal military caste. Only the Dutch East India Company was allowed to visit the islands, and they were restricted to the port of Nagasaki. Others landing on shore were put to death. In the 19th century, the Russians began encroaching from the north, while American whalers and merchant ships approached in the south. Japan made some concessions, but allowed only a few landings, and often used force to keep the foreigners out. Commodore Matthew Perry sailed twice to Japan in the early 19, 1850s. By diplomacy and force, including a cannonade on Tokyo Bay, he negotiated the Treaty of Peace and Amity, guaranteeing good treatment for shipwrecked American sailors, a consul in permanent residence, and three ports open to American whalers. Commodore Perry gave a banquet aboard the USS Powhatan to celebrate the signing of the treaty. Now, if you look at this gun. Oh, did that work? <laughs> yeah, let me see. There here. we go. There's the point. If you, if you look at the gun here, that's much exaggerated in size, but I think it shows the, the psychology of the Japanese, their awe in front of the Western technology. Uh, they had nothing comparable to such weapons uh, or the ships that carried them. Uh, the force of a modern industrial state was also vividly on display in China. Beginning in the first, with the first opium war in 1839, European powers carved out extraterritorial extra enclaves and forced concessions on a supine China. A hundred years of chaos followed, an object lesson on the fate awaiting backward Asian nations. Now look at the Japanese century and greeting standing there to greet uh, Perry. He's carrying a spear. And compare that now to the U.S. sailors with rifles at modern weaponry. That shows what uh, 
what the Japanese were facing. The Japanese, of course, realized that to avoid the fate of China, as well as partaking the plunder of that unfortunate land, they must adopt Western technology, weapons, and organization, something they were not slow to do. Just 40 years after the treaty with Perry, they began the Sino-Japanese War for control of Korea. Their new modern army, look at, look at uh, how they are now, use this one right oh. Oh, well, yeah, I'll get used to this can... pointer thing uh, <laughs> eventually but look now they're in uniforms they're carrying uh, rifles that's a they're, they're modernizing their army uh, they won easily over the uh, Chinese but then France Germany and Russia intervened rewriting the peace treaty to their own advantage the Japanese emerged confident in their military power but humiliated and bitter over forced over being forced to submit to the Europeans. Let's see. Determined to get control of Korea and be counted among the great powers, Japan launched the Russo-Japanese War in 1904 with a surprise naval attack on the Russian fleet in Port Arthur, sort of a uh, preview of what they would do to the American fleet 37 years later at Pearl Harbor. Now look at the uniforms. These are modern troops, right, with uh, rifles and binoculars and the whole kit. And compare that to the samurai that met uh, Perry just 40 years earlier. Although it's worth noting that although they are modern troops, they're still carrying samurai swords. So they haven't changed completely. The warrior nature is still there. The war was won. Uh, the Russo-Japanese War was won when Admiral Hihachiro Togo led the modern battleships of the Imperial Navy to a crushing victory over the Russian fleet at the Battle of Tsushima, one of the decisive battles of world history. Japan's status as one of the great powers seemed to be confirmed when Great Britain, the greatest of the imperial powers, entered a naval alliance with her. Uh, Japan fought uh, alongside the Allies in World War I and did very well, seizing German colonies in the Marshall, Caroline, and Marianas Islands, as well as Qingtao on the Shantung Peninsula of China. Now, according to the, uh, to the treaties, Qingtao should have gone back to China, but the Japanese kept it as spoils of war. One of the reasons the U.S. Senate refused to uh, sign the Versailles Treaty. Further tension came from U.S. immigration policy, which the Japanese thought treated them as inferiors, especially galling to them since they could, were convinced of their own racial superiority. It was widely believed an arms race caused World War I, so various disarmament treaties were negotiated after the bloodbath. The Washington and London Naval Treaties, 1922 and 1930, established a ratio of 5 to 5 to 3 for U.S., British, and Japanese capital ships. To compensate Japan for its smaller numbers, the U.S. agreed not to fortify the Philippines or Guam, precluding an American fleet presence in the Western Pacific and giving the Japanese a considerable military advantage in time and distance from the battlefield. To persuade America to agree to the treaty and avoid a financially ruinous uh, naval race, the exhausted British allowed their alliance with Japan to lapse. The Japanese admired the English, consciously patterned the Imperial Navy on the Royal Navy, and initially bought capital ships from English yards. They were isolated and humiliated at losing the alliance and being forced to accept fewer warships than the other great powers. As an aside, uh, in regard to the exhaustion of the British, this is Arthur Balfour, who negotiated the treaty uh, for the British. And that's how he looked in 1925 or so, but this is how he looked in 1908 in a painting by John Singer Sargent. Look at that man, the, 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 the confidence, the arrogance. That is the imperial ruling class of Britain at the height of, uh, of, of its empire. Winston Churchill was from that same class. Um, during the 1920s and 30s, the Japanese military took over the government, its control enhanced by several assassinations of senior government officials by mid-level Japanese army officers. 
The murderers were released with the lightest of sentences. The Prime Minister, Osachi Hamaguchi, was murdered by a nationalist fanatic after signing the London Naval Treaty. In February 1936, the army occupied Tokyo. You can see them marching through the streets of that city. Here, here is a fairly substantial formation of troops moving through the, uh, through the streets of Tokyo. The army's principal interest was China, where it was a law unto itself. Campaigning there since the 1890s, it conquered Manchuria largely on its own initiative in 1931 and 32. Branded as aggressors, the Japanese left the League of Nations in 1933, then signed the Anti-Comintern Pact with Germany and Italy in 1936. In 1937, Army firebrands engineered the Marco Polo Bridge incident and invaded China uh, proper. This is Japanese troops, let's see, there it is, Japanese troops marching over the Great Wall itself, and what followed was some of the most brutal warfare uh, in, in memory. Shanghai fell in November, followed by the rape of Nanking, perhaps the biggest slaughter in human history. The death toll exceeded 100,000 with estimates as high as 300,000, including tens of thousands of women raped and then killed. 1938 saw further victories in the Yangtze Valley, and the Japanese wound up with 700,000 square miles of China and 170 million people. Then the triumphant Japanese, though, found themselves confronting the Clausewitzian doc dictum that while it may be easy to conquer, it is difficult to occupy. The arrogance of the Japanese military grew apace. In 1937, they strafed the British ambassador to China and attacked the American gunboat Pane and the British Ladybird. Tokyo quickly apologized and offered compensation, but America was outraged and condemned the aggression against China all the more fervently. Japan saw the outbreak of war in Europe as a golden opportunity to fulfill its destiny by bringing all Asia under the divine dominion of the emperor. There were two possible strategies. They could take advantage of the German invasion of Russia to attack north and west, but in 1938 and 1939, they had had major clashes with the Soviets along the Manchurian-Siberian border. 57,000 Russian troops with 500 tanks and 350 armored cars fought 30,000 Japanese without armor. The Red Army inflicted a total and humiliating defeat on the Japanese. One Japanese uh, task force of 15,000 men suffered 11,000 casualties. They, the army realized they were outclassed by the Soviets in armor, artillery, and aircraft. They were also heavily engaged in China, and so the army had little desire to fight the Russians. Politically, Hitler and Stalin signed the non-aggression pact during that Siberian campaign. So that eliminated whatever alliance obligation the Japanese might have felt towards the uh, Germans. In 1940, Congress passed the Two Ocean Navy Act. Superior American industrial and financial resources meant the Japanese Navy was doomed to grow weaker compared to the U.S. fleet. By 1943, the difference would be overwhelming. The Imperial Navy argued to leave the Russians to the Germans, who seemed to be doing a good job of it, and attack south to seize what they called the Southern Resources Area. Down here. Um, the colonies of France, Britain, and Holland, all of whom were heavily engaged or conquered in Europe, uh, and s take their riches in oil, rubber, and rice. The problem was that the Americans stood on the lines of communication with their uh, colony in the Philippines. What was America doing in the Philippines? Well, we were there because uh, thanks to the victory of Commodore George Dewey in the Battle of Manila Bay in 1898. The islands became a colony and extending, it extended what that age regarded as our manifest destiny, so bringing America into direct contact with the expanding power of militaristic Japan. 
Army plans were to defend the colony by holding Corregidor in accordance with the Washington Naval Treaty, the only fortification in the islands. They would, they would hold it for six months to two years while the U.S. fleet fought its way across the Pacific. That was their plan. The Navy thought the Philippines indefensible and gave little credence to relieving the garrison. Instead, it developed War Plan Orange, principally at the Naval War College, projecting a methodical advance, island hopping across the Central Pacific, and building bases from which to confront and defeat the Japanese in a decisive fleet engagement, a la Alfred Thermahan. Codified as War Plan Orange, it became part of the Navy's DNA and was followed faithfully as its strategy for fighting the Pacific War. Despite the parlous state of, American, of the American military, FDR adopted an increasingly aggressive posture toward Japan to send a message that mission so cherished by politicians. He ordered the U.S. Pacific Fleet, based at San Diego, to remain in Hawaiian waters after the 1940 maneuvers. Nonetheless, with the fall of France in 1940, FDR increased American support for Britain against Germany. Naval vessels were taken from the Pacific Fleet and sent to the Atlantic, where they escorted eastbound convoys to mid-ocean, trading fire with German U-boats, sinking them and being sunk. Despite reducing in-theater forces, FDR escalated his pressure on the Japanese. Admiral James O. Richardson, commander-in-chief of the U.S. fleet, what I, I, I got to say, look at the jaw on this guy. I mean, this is really... This is a, a, a powerful-looking man. Of course, FDR was no uh, wimp himself. Uh, at any rate, Richardson um, a, a strongly objected to keeping the fleet in Hawaii, 2,000 miles from the indispensable dockyard shops and skilled workers at its regular base in San Diego. He argued the only real deterrent to, the, to Japan was a fleet ready to fight, and for that it needed to be based in California. He thought Pearl Harbor dangerously exposed and poorly defended, and he robustly expressed that opinion in Washington. He closely, he closely questioned General George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, about the lack of anti-aircraft artillery and long-range search planes needed to protect the fleet, an Army responsibility. In a face-to-face -face meeting with FDR in October 1940, he forcefully presented his arguments. The president responded by relieving him in January 1941, a year early. Firing Richardson emphatically settled the issue of where the fleet would be based, a lesson not lost on Richardson's successor, Admiral Husband Kimmel. Apart from losing ships to the Atlantic, and by the way, I think this is a very revealing photo because that's a chart of the Atlantic that Richardson and his uh, senior staffers are looking at. Um, so, um, Kimmel's biggest dilemma was what defense condition was appropriate for the fleet to maintain. Several times he got messages from uh, Washington saying war was imminent, but upon inquiring if he should go to full war alert, Washington minimized the immediacy of the threat. It's impossible to keep the fleet on a war footing all the time. Training and equipment maintenance suffer when readiness levels are kept too high too long, decreasing the ability to fight. A big part of American strategy in the Pacific was being built around the new superweapon, the B-17 Flying Fortress. The Army Air Corps promised to fulfill the theories of Douay and Mitchell, winning the war by air power alone. As growing numbers came into service, America increased its forward posture. The Philippines would not be abandoned, a strategy repugnant to the Army. Instead, Douglas MacArthur and the Philippine Army were recalled to the colors, and 35 B-17s stationed in the Philippines at the expense of reinforcing Hawaii. The final crisis began in March 1941, when Japanese troops seized Saigon in French Indochina, then confiscated the rice crop. Germany invaded Russia in June, and the collapse of Soviet resistance seemed imminent. Japan proclaimed a protectorate over French Indochina. America, Britain, and Holland responded by freezing all Japanese assets 
and imposed a trade embargo. On August 1st, FDR embargoed high-octane gasoline and crude oil. America was the leading oil producer of the day. Without its products, Japanese industries would be paralyzed within a year. Its navy disabled in two. On October 16th, General Hideki Tojo became the new prime minister. Every aspect of Japanese political, economic, and social life was now subordinated to the military and regimented to the purpose of serving the war effort. In November 1940, the Royal Navy attacked the Italian fleet in the harbor of Toronto. Twenty obsolescent swordfish biplanes flying from a single carrier sank three battleships and damaged two others. Looking at the results, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, commander of the Japanese combined fleet, began to ponder a similar attack on Pearl Harbor. Rather than a single ship with a handful of biplanes, his first air fleet, the Kido Butai, had six large up-to-date fleet carriers with over 400 modern airplanes assembled into a single task force, which was a revolution in tactics. At that time, the U.S. Navy was operating its carriers in individual units, in other words, one carrier with its escorts. Um, no one had ever seen and few imagined such a concentration of seaborne air power. Not to mention, look at the difference between these planes. This is the swordfish, which looks almost like a relic from World War I, and look at the Japanese planes. Those are, well, there's, there's no question who's the superior, who has the superior equipment here. Pearl Harbor was just one part of an audacious plan that spanned a quarter of the globe. As the bombs would fall on Hawaii, troops would land in Malaya and Thailand, followed shortly by action against Borneo and the Philippines. The operational objective of the raid on Hawaii, and this is key, was to, it was a raid, and their objective was to cripple U.S. naval power in the Pacific for six months giving the Japan the time to seize the southern resources area and set up a defense in depth. On November 26, 1941, the Kido Butai sailed from the Kurile Islands in the far north of Japan. Six days out, the message came to climb Mount Nitaka. That was the order to proceed with the attack. The ships turned west into stormy seas and overcast skies, hiding in the foul weather and sailing far from shipping lanes. At 2100 on December 6, Admiral Togo's battle flag from Tsushima was hoisted over the flagship Akagi as the carriers turned south and bent on 26 knots. At 0600 next morning, 275 miles north of Pearl Harbor, the first wave of 140 bombers and 43 fighters launched. A second wave followed, over 350 planes in all magnificently trained and eager for battle. One pilot exulted, an air attack on Hawaii, a dream come true. We would teach the arrogant Anglo-Saxon scoundrels a lesson. At 0740, the lead planes ducked under the overcast and saw the coast of Oahu, 50 miles away, undefended. The strike leader, Commander Mitsuo Fushida, broke radio silence to signal, Tora, Tora, Tora meaning they had achieved surprise. Over the airmen's objections, a submarine force was also sent against Hawaii, consisting of five midget submarines intended to penetrate Pearl Harbor itself. At 0342 on the 7th, the minesweeper Condor, a converted fishing boat patrolling the approaches, sighted a periscope and alerted the 1918 vintage destroyer Ward by Blinker. Working at night with only binoculars and the most primitive sonar, Ward searched for nearly three hours with no uh, result. False periscope sightings were far from unheard of, but Ward took her picket duty in deadly earnest and persisted until she found the enemy at 0645. She attacked at once with guns and depth charges, destroying the sub. She promptly reported the engagement to 14th Naval District Headquarters in Honolulu. 
They notified the Pacific Fleet duty officer who called Admiral Kimmel to, at his quarters about 0725. The Admiral finished dressing and headed to his office. Alert but un unaware air attack was imminent. About the time Fushida signaled Tora Tora Tora, Rear Admiral William Furlong, SOPA, uh, which means Senior Officer President of Float, um, that, which is what his, what he, his, his uh, role in Pearl Harbor itself. He came onto the quarterdeck of his flagship Oglala to observe Sunday colors. So let's see. That's mine. There it is. So he comes out on uh, the deck of the Oglala um, and awaiting uh, the ceremony at 0800, he saw a plane bank over Naval Station at Naval Air Station Ford Island and heard an explosion. Here's Ford Island. Um, the Admiral thought, what a stupid, careless pilot. But as the plane banked, he saw the rising sun insignia and ordered, Japanese, man your stations, then all ships in harbor, sortie. Ensign Richard Brooks, officer of the deck on the battleship West Virginia, back here, um, thought the blast on Ford Island was an internal explosion aboard California and called away the ship's fire and rescue party, fortuitously bringing a large, organized body of men and their equipment topside. They reached the quarter deck just as West Virginia was hit by the first of six or seven torpedoes. There's a little bit of a controversy about this. You can see the torpedo wakes in the water, and here's West Virginia. And the, con the, the controversy is that some think these torpedoes were actually fired, or some of them were actually fired by a midget submarine that penetrated the harbor. Um, be that as it may, um, Lieutenant, later Admiral, Claude Ricketts, leading the damage control party aboard West Virginia, was the senior officer on deck, and he immediately saw to the manning of weapons and gun directors on the West Virginia. Then, with the ship quickly listing to port, he went below to oversee counter-flooding, to keep the ship from capsizing. The crew calmly evacuated the wounded while ammunition trains were organized to feed the guns. West Virginia's Captain Mervyn Benyon was severely wounded by bomb fragments but refused evacuation, remaining exposed to enemy fire while fighting his ship from the bridge. This is from uh, Lieutenant Rick Ricketts after action report. Heavy black smoke poured up over the bridge and boat deck forward. The bridge was covered with fire. The personnel I left with the captain had been forced to leave him and come aft for air. I went forward and found him partially conscious. The bridge was completely obliterated with heavy black smoke. Let me take a moment. This white box shows you the bridge area. Look at, can you imagine what it must have been like to be on that bridge amidst the, amidst the smoke and the fire and the chaos. Um, to, to continue with, uh, with Ricketts' account, Lieutenant J.G. White, one enlisted man, and I attempted to fight the heavy fire on the forward part of the bridge, but the water pressure was not enough to have much effect. About this time, Leek came to me and said, Mr. Ricketts, the captain is about gone. Mess attendant Doris Miller was one of the brave sailors on the bridge that terrible morning. His battle station was at an ammunition magazine, but finding it wrecked, he went up on deck. Because of his size and strength, he was detailed to move the wounded to safer areas, then sent to the bridge. Let's see. Oh, there we go. There's Ricketts, and that's uh, Doris Miller. Um... Miller's Navy Cross citation reads in part, For distinguished devotion to duty, extraordinary courage, and disregard for his own personal safety, while at the side of his captain on the bridge, Miller, despite enemy strafing and bombing, and in the face of a serious fire, assisted in moving his captain, who had been mortally wounded, to a place of greater safety, and later manned and operated a machine gun directly, uh, directed at the enemy. Aircraft uh, until he was ordered to leave the bridge. Um, the Navy Cross, by the way, 
shown here, is the second highest award that uh, the military can give, second only to the Con Congressional Medal of Honor. Miller was lost when the escort carrier Liscombe Bay went down in the Gilberts in November 1943. West Virginia sank, but thanks to Ricketts' efforts, did not capsize. Of her crew that fought so bravely to save their ship, Captain Benyon and 104 men were killed, 52 wounded. Just before colors, a torpedo passed underneath the repair ship Vestal and hit the battleship Arizona, tied up inboard of the Vestal, and that was followed by a 16-inch armor-piercing artillery shell modified to be dropped from the air. It detonated one of Arizona's forward magazines, producing a massive explosion that sent a sheet of flame 500 feet into the air. Of the crew of over 1,500, of, of 1500 over 1,100 were killed, including the captain, Franklin Van Valkenburg, and Admiral Isaac Kidd. From a nearby hill, Admiral Kimmel saw Arizona lift out of the water, then sink back down, way down. He was shocked but composed. While watching, he was hit in the chest by a spent 50 caliber bullet, after which he murmured, it would have been merciful had it killed me. There's Arizona in happier times. Beautiful ship. I was just uh, looking. They have a wonderful model of the uh, of the ship just outside our offices here. And I encourage any of you that uh, come to the museum, please take a look at these uh, ship models. They're magnificent. This is the Vestal that was that was anchored just outboard of the uh, of the Arizona. She's a repair ship. And uh, she was hit by two bombs and heavily aflame when the explosion of the Arizona both blew out the flames and blew a hundred crewmen overboard, including the captain, Casson Young. Someone aboard cried, abandon ship then, to, and, and cried abandon ship, and then, to quote Gordon Prang, a figure like some strange sea creature climbed out of the harbor and stood athwart the gangway. It was Young oil dripping from his face and body, but none the worse for his dunking. Where the hell do you think you're going, he demanded of the officer of the deck. We're abandoning ship, the man replied. Get back aboard, young roared. You don't abandon ship on me. With that, the crew returned to their stations and saved the ship. For his action, Young was promoted to captain and given command of the cruiser San Francisco, aboard which he was killed in the first naval battle of Guadalcanal. Oklahoma was hit by three torpedoes in the first minutes of the attack, producing a rapid list to port. Abandoned ship was ordered just minutes later before she turned turtle. 415 men died aboard her. And that's her upside down. And again, in happier days. On California... Hatches and scuttles were open for an inspection the next day. So when two torpedoes hit at 0805, the ship rapidly took on water. Counterflooding kept her on an even keel, even after being hit again by enemy bombers, and the crew labored magnificently to get her underway. But at 0910, burning oil swept down from windward, engulfing the stern in flames and forcing the captain to order abandoned ship an hour later. At the bottom of battleship row, Nevada's anti-aircraft batteries responded quickly to the attack, but a torpedo hit forward opened a 45 by 30 foot hole, causing some flooding. Nonetheless, the duty officer decided to get underway. During the height of the strafing and bombing, Chief Boson Edward Hill, Edwin Hill led a detail onto the quay, cast off the lines, and swam back to the ship. She was the only battleship to get underway that dreadful morning. Now, you can see, this is California, down, fires all over the place, and here's Nevada in the smoke, trying to get out of the harbor. With the eyes of the fleet on her, Lieutenant Commander Francis Thomas conned Nevada over a mile toward the harbor entrance through an inferno of explosions, fire, and smoke, while under repeated air attack. Nevada was down by the bow, and Commander Thomas realized that if she sank in the channel, the fleet would be bottled up for months. He 
he decided to beach her on Hospital Point. I'd like to make a comment about what uh, John Parshall said uh, in the last webinar on Pearl Harbor uh, about the Japanese wasting their bombs on Nevada. That's, uh, that's no doubt true, and it does show a lack of discipline uh, by the Japanese uh, pilots, but the, the, the prize was so glittering. They were there to keep the U.S. fleet from intervening in the Pacific for six months. Had Nevada been sunk in the harbor, that uh, in the channel, that would have done the trick. And so, gosh, uh, it, it was such a glittering prize that one can understand or not agree with them focusing uh, their efforts there on the Nevada. Um, once, once she was beached, Boson Hill led the anchor detail onto the forecastle to, to secure the ship. And while attempting to let go the anchors, was blown overboard and killed by the explosion of several bombs. For his bravery that day, Mr. Hill was posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. The other target uh, for the Japanese, were the, the other targets for the Japanese were the aircraft on Oahu. For the raid to succeed and withdraw safely, American air power had to be destroyed. Half the attacking planes were sent against the various airfields. The main Army fighter base at Wheeler Field in central Oahu had dirt bunkers 10 feet high to protect the planes. But General Walter Short, the Army commander in Hawaii, ordered the planes lined up on the runway where they could best be guarded against sabotage. The neatly parked aircraft exploded in flames as they were hit, igniting adjacent aircraft. Half the fighter planes at Wheeler and half the bombers at Hickam were destroyed or badly damaged. Most of the Navy's PBY search planes were also destroyed. A Japanese airman later wrote, Looking at my comrades in their planes, I could see them grinning, hungry for good games. Wheeler Air Base was a sea of fire, which indeed it looks to be here. Finding no opposition in the air, Japanese planes dropped to treetop height to strafe. The enemy lost only 29 aircraft before returning to the carriers, where they were met with jubilation, but the victory was incomplete. The vast fuel farms and dockside infrastructure were untouched, while the U.S. carriers remained at large. Commander Fushida, the strike leader, later claimed he wanted to make another strike to finish the job, forcing the Pacific Fleet back to, to California. He wrote that on returning to Akagi, he went to the bridge to press his views on Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, the Japanese commander. Asked where the American carriers were, he replied, no doubt hunting the Japanese at that moment, a thought that would have sent a chill across the flag bridge. Commander Minoru Genda, fleet air officer, urged the Admiral to hunt down the U.S. carriers even if it took several days, confident the Zeros would protect the Kido Butai from enemy airplanes. There was no such discussion that day, and if there had been, there was no chance Admiral Nagumo would remain in Hawaiian waters. The carriers were working within a tightly orchestrated operation plan that required them to immediately sail for the Far East to support the conquest of the Indies, the reason Japan went to war. Nagumo had brooded over the dangers of the mission for months, and no doubt recalled the September war games in which two carriers uh, and a third of the attacking force were lost. His mission was to raid Pearl Harbor, and having accomplished it, Nagumo departed with his ships undamaged. Any criticism for failure to continue the battle rests with Yamamoto, who defined the objectives for the raid, and had he wished uh, Nagumo to more thoroughly destroy Pearl Harbor, he should have put it in the operation order. What terrible sights uh, we saw that day. Uh, the Japanese left devastation in their wake. In the words of Gordon Prang, Pearl Harbor was a hell pit of smoke, gray, brown, white, lemon, yellow, black, and black again. Acrid, foul, mushrooming billows erupting skyward, like a mass of storm clouds. Note Oglala here. That was uh, uh, Admiral Furlong's flagship that he walked out on to see the beginning of the attack. And here is Oklahoma capsized 
and Battleship Row just a mass of smoke and flame. Although it was a hard blow, the strategic damage to American power was relatively light. Of necessity, the loss of the battle line focused U.S. Navy strategy on carrier warfare, the key to the war in the Pacific. Obsolete battleships were sunk in the most convenient way, with a cruel but limited loss of life. Had they been sunk at sea, thousands more sailors would have drowned. Instead, those veterans were released to become the nucleus of the vastly expanded Pacific Fleet that would cross the ocean and avenge Pearl Harbor. Who was responsible? Admiral Kimmel and General Short were relieved of command. They could have had better support, but Admiral Ernest King, the new Chief of Naval Operations, made this brutal but necessary judgment. Admiral Stark and Admiral Kimmel were responsible officers. The derelictions indicate lack of the superior judgment necessary for exercising command commensurate with that rank, and their assigned duties rather than culpable inefficiency. Relegation of both these officers to positions in which lack of superior judgment may not, rest, may not result in future errors is appropriate. Ultimate responsibility for the debacle must rest with President Roosevelt. It was his policy that put the fleet in an exposed position where the Japanese could attack it while diverting scarce resources to the Atlantic and the Philippines. Admiral Richardson correctly judged FDR's policy of bluff, one the Japanese called. But as opposed to admirals and generals, only the people can fire the President of the United States, and then only every four years. There's a, um, a school of thought that says Japan lost the war the day they bombed Pearl Harbor, that American victory was inevitable because the United States was larger and richer and more industrialized and so on. That is a pernicious lie. On that day in December, the Japanese commanded a mighty fleet. Their army was battle-hardened and victorious. Their soldiers and sailors were brave, disciplined, and well-trained. From Alexander's conquest of Persia to the Vietnam War, history is filled with lesser powers defeating greater ones. To imply the American triumph was preordained belittles the valor of our fathers and our own great heritage. Thank you. And, uh, All right. Thank you, Captain Jacobs. I know a uh, virtual, virtual applause. <laughs> I know I can't hear that. But, Thank you. Thank um, you. I have a couple questions Please. Um, that I thought I could and yeah, this is by voice, folks. This is Chrissy uh, here looking at your uh, questions coming in. First off, um, start off with David. He was asking, do you know the, the views of Lindbergh and the America First movement on the Japanese war in China and F FDR's preparations for conflict in the Pacific? How did they feel well, about all that? Well, uh, <laughs> to be uh, frank, no, I have no idea what Lindbergh's yeah. ideas were about uh, the Japanese in the Pacific. And I don't know a whole heck of a lot about his ideas, uh, the America First stuff, more than just sort of a headline level. Uh, and what was the second part? Um, yeah, just about not just the war in China, but also like the um, build, like FDR's build up to pre prepare to go to war in the Pacific. Uh, oh well, so. he didn't. I mean, no. uh, that was that's one of the problems. One of the points I tried to make is that he didn't really build up. For the war in the Pacific, he, uh, he he did send the B-17s to the Philippines, where they were even more exposed than the fleet was in Hawaii. Um, but he kept pulling assets away from the Pacific to send it send them to the Atlantic. My personal opinion, for what it's worth, is that uh, FDR he wanted a war, but he wanted to go to war with Germany. That that was the war he was seeking. I mean, he he kept. Poking him in the chest, uh, the, the the undeclared naval war, um, and and so forth was uh, provocation to the to the Germans clearly, um, and, and Japan just so I think without any necessary uh, backing for this, it sort of caught him by surprise that the Japanese would do this. I mean, obviously it was a surprise. Uh, we were sure surprised. Uh, mm -hmm. So. I, again, I blame uh, Pearl Harbor. If anyone gets the blame for the surprise attack, it's FDR. Yeah. I feel like your comments are also, since we're on the mm. eve of Election Day, oh. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that feels very timely. 
Um, another question from Gail. She was asking, were PBYs um, stationed elsewhere? Do you know this? Or were they... Or were there new planes built to replace those lost in Pearl Harbor? Oh no, there were. So, uh, there were. That was not the whole uh, PBY fleet for the U.S. Navy. There were PBYs stationed in uh, the Philippines. As a matter of fact, a future uh, chief of naval operations, Tom Moore, uh, was on a PBY in the Philippines and managed to. They they flew out and redeployed to to the Indies and so on and so forth. Uh, they, they also, we also had PBYs on the Atlantic coast, and I'm sure there was some in, uh, in California as well. Um, it, it, speaking of, if I may, yeah. uh, modern things, that my, my little comment about Clausewitz and uh, easy to uh, occupy, hard, I mean, easy to conquer, hard to occupy, mm -hmm. I think that's all too relevant to our recent military history mm -hmm. uh, in America. Yeah, um, and it's... You know, I, I speak a lot with students, so, you know, we always want to draw out those modern implications of the things we've learned. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that comment. Thank you. Um, another question coming in, um, Steve is wondering, um, what was the reaction here in the U.S. after finding out about the rape of Nan King? You know, oh. the sense of, you know, what that would be. Oh, people were to, outraged. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, those, uh, although you, you have to keep in mind, people who, who, followed these things were outraged. Uh, the depression's going on. I believe a great many people thought, gee, that's, uh, to paraphrase um, Chamberlain, it's uh, a country far away of which we know very little. And uh, particularly after World War I, where America, uh, after that war, America felt like we had been bamboozled into going to war to save the British, uh, that, that we really didn't have much at stake. And so the, the prevalent opinion in the United States was one of isolationism. Uh, the foreigners may be killing themselves, but they do that all the time anyway. Uh, yes, the Japanese are, are doing reprehensible things, but um, it's not our business. Right. Yeah. And then, um, as maybe we'll give another couple minutes for folks to type in questions, but for me, you know, I want to ask every presenter if there's time, um, you know, what... If you could sum up in a sentence or two what you think the what the legacy of the attack on Pearl Harbor and, and its meaning today, I mean, could you kind of say, I know that's a tough one. <laughs> so, right. Well, the, um, leg the legacy of Pearl Harbor, of course, is that uh, we went to war with Japan. Many people think that uh, we declared war on Germany. You know, I mentioned a few moments ago that uh, FDR wanted to go to war with Germany. At least that's my opinion. Uh, and imagine his conundrum when, oh my God, we're at war with Japan, and how do you declare war on Germany because the Japanese attacked us? You can't. Uh, but Hitler declared war on America. This is, uh, a lot of people don't realize this. We didn't declare war on him at first. He declared war on us. Uh, and so that's, that's how we got into, in, into that war. Um, the lessons for today. Oh, brother. Uh, do you want to Think about that for a moment, and we'll get to another <laughs> you question. Have a, you, know, you have another yeah, question. Yeah, we've got right? one from Mike here. He says, being a naval officer and a historian, are you aware of the Navy at Pearl Harbor changing ship numbers or paint configurations to pull the Japanese island spotters as the ships um, remaining in the new Pacific fleet? Have you heard that before? You know, back, in the back of my brain, I think I maybe <laughs> did, but there's nothing I could, yeah. uh, I couldn't pin it on, uh, on anything. Um, all right, let's see. We've got another um, – man, I, I appreciate uh, questions coming here. They're, they're long, though. So Bob is asking, <laughs> in the book Pearl Harbor Final Judgment by Henry Clausen, he agreed that Kimmel and Short were negligent. Pearl Harbor had a magic machine, but this was kept from the commanders because we did not want the Japanese to know we broke their diplomatic code. General Marshall made this decision. Does he have some responsibility for the attack? <laughs> well, uh, I, I haven't read that particular book, but since since you brought up the issue of intelligence, that's a very very naughty yeah. problem. Um, the, as a naval officer and a more student of, of naval history, there's a there's quite a a brouhaha over um, Richmond Kelly Turner, Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner, who was uh, operations officer 
in Washington. He was the, the Navy's operations officer. And he had a big fight with the intelligence community over who disseminates what. Um, there, this, is, this is always an argument, right? Uh, do you send out raw intelligence to the field or does someone sift through it and say, well, this is what we think? And if someone sifts through it, who does that? Uh, Turner, who was a extremely strong personality, um, felt that he would get the raw data and he would send what uh, he thought appropriate to the field, to, uh, to Hawaii. For this, he's excoriated by, um, what's the guy's name, uh, Leighton? Uh, I was there. Um, I, was, I, th I think it's, it's Leighton. That's a, he was a, um, uh, an intel officer at Pearl Harbor and wrote an extensive book and, of course, pillories uh, uh, Turner over this. But, but this is always a problem in intelligence. Uh, in intelligence, there's always plenty of intelligence. There's people telling you all kinds of things. Clausewitz says that when the battle breaks out, everybody comes running up to you telling you things, most of which is wrong. And the same is true of intelligence. There's intelligence out there that says everything, uh, which is right. That's, that's why Turner said, no, no, I'll sift through it and tell you what I think is right. Um, I guess he didn't get it entirely correct this time, but um, that's, that's the world of intelligence. You never all right, we've got some more uh, rolling in, if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> no, not at so, all. Uh, Robert, at, Robert is asking, on the evening of December 7th, did FDR and the Navy and the War Departments know the bulk of the fleet was at Pearl Harbor? Like, did we have a sense of, obviously, or our president have a sense of what ships were there and what weren't? You oh, know? I would, uh, so, yes. Yeah. Uh, of so. course they would have known. Uh, now, they, there may have been a little confusion about uh, whether the Enterprise had come in. She was due in that day. Uh, uh, she should have been in harbor uh, when the Japanese attacked, but mm -hmm. she had been ta taking planes to uh, Wake, I believe it was, yeah, and so. couldn't quite get back in time. Um, so there might have been a little confusion over that, but uh, yeah, they, they would have known who was, who was there. Yeah. Okay, um, this is, I think, more of a personal question. Jana is asking, um, while we could have lost otherwise, do you think that a sneak attack made uh, the United States too angry to lose? No, <laughs> not too angry to lose, but it did, uh, it, it definitely provoked uh, furor across the entire country and a, a desire for revenge against the Japanese. As a matter of fact, uh, when we went to war with Germany, there was, or the Germans went to war with us, there was some resistance to that because we, People were saying, well, no, I want to go fight the Japanese. They're the ones that attacked us. Germans, what difference do the Germans make? Um, so, uh, but no, uh, we were good and mad, but uh, lasted four years. So yeah. right. Some of that wore off. Yeah. Um, and then the last question I have here is, uh, you talked about one of the carriers delivering um, planes to Wake Island. Enterprise, coming back. Can, yeah. uh, can you talk about where the other two were, the Saratoga oh, and the uh, Lexington? Lexington. You know, I don't th I think it's Saratoga not Saratoga. Saratoga's, Saratoga's, uh, in California. That's, yeah, <laughs> I think, I, yeah. Well, Cal so, Saratoga goes back to so. California a bunch to get yeah. repaired. She got, she got hit several times. Uh, I think it, it, it's Enterprise, Yorktown. Oh, is she in the Atlantic? Oh, brother. Well, <laughs> well you got me there. We'll you got me there. Yeah, but, we'll uh, send you the info. Um, so, uh, one more question from Robert Please. coming in. He said, um, wasn't the fleet so organized that the battleships Arizona, Oklahoma, and Nevada should have had a, uh, should have accompanied the Enterprise to wake? Like, shouldn't have the battleships no. gone? With no, them? no. Okay. The, the, the problem was the, the carriers were fast. I mean, the carriers could do mm, over 30 knots, and the battleships were slow. Uh, Nevada would probably be very old ship, really World War One vintage. Would be hard pressed to get over 25 knots. Uh, as a rule, the uh, carrier admirals wanted nothing to do with the battleships. Uh, they thought they were dinosaurs. Uh, now the battleship sailors felt differently, obviously, and the battleships did play uh, a, an a interesting and worthwhile role during the war. But uh, no, they, uh, they. I think. 
that, that gentleman's thinking of later in the war uh, when we had, for example, the, the uh, Iowa class, which just bristled with anti-aircraft guns uh, yeah, that, and could also go 35 knots. That was a real asset, a real gun platform to, to have by the carriers, but not these older battleships. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Oh, and then keep getting, keep getting a couple in. Good. So keep them coming. Right, keep um, them coming. All right. So Al is asking, what is your view about the claims made by many authors that FDR and others in Washington knew the Japanese fleet had left Japan, likely on their way east, and that this information was kept from Admiral Kimmel? I think, I think in essence, it's bump. Uh, FDR was a former undersecretary of the Navy. And as a matter of fact, he had a habit of referring to the Navy as us and the Army as them, which George, Mar George Marshall early in the war said, please don't do that anymore, Mr. <laughs> President. Uh, uh, the, the idea that FDR would knowingly allow the fleet to be shot to bits like that, I just, I, I can't... Uh, it doesn't register with me. Again, as, as I mentioned earlier, intelligence, there's always lots and lots of intelligence. And perhaps, I'm, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if you could find somewhere some message traffic saying, you know, we don't know where the Japanese uh, fleet is. They're somewhere at sea. Uh, it, the, the, the general rule of thumb, people who thought war was imminent said the Japanese are going to Southeast Asia. That's, I mean, that's what they wanted. That, that's where they, they went right after the raids, so that was the, the conventional wisdom. Yes, war is imminent, and it's going to start when the Japanese attack Singapore, uh, Thailand, the, the, the Dutch East Indies, and so forth. So there may have been some message traffic out there otherwise, but this idea that FDR knowingly allowed the fleet to be shot up like that, I, I can't credit yeah. that at all. Feel, feel that way too. Um, I think that's uh, it in terms of questions. So what I may do, folks, is actually uh, we're I think we're right on time, which is fantastic. Um, I'm going to switch over to we have one more kind of webinar area with closing reminders. the The webcam is going to go away, so we'll say a virtual goodbye. Thanks <laughs> that for coming. Way. Yeah, thank you, Captain Jacobs. My pleasure. My All right, pleasure. we're here, and you folks are going to see your ch screen change one more time. First off, let me um, let me start at the beginning here. So part three of this uh, webinar or this online learning series is actually to watch the commemoration ceremony here. We're a month away now from the attack on Pearl Harbor anniversary. So part three is viewing the commemoration ceremony that will feature speakers that, um, oh, let me go back to that. That's switching too quickly for me. Come on. Sorry, bear with me here. Let's try this again. Go back. There we go. Um, this featuring speakers including Lieutenant General Rex McMillan, uh, best-selling author Ian Toll, and the museum's uh, Samuel Z. Murray Stone senior historian Robert Satino. You'll watch that in a different way than you watch this program. You'll click on this live stream link, which I will send to all of you, and it's something that's just a link that you can pop up and watch the live program happening here in front of a live audience at the museum. So that's coming up in a, mo in a month. In a month and a day will be a part four of our webinar series, and that will be uh, talking about, so now we're at uh, December 1941, December 8th, and this webinar will be tracing the invasion of Guam, Wake Island, and the Philippines, which were also invaded by um, and attacked by the Japanese um, in that period of time. Uh, and uh, we will be actually here at the museum again, and Curator Larry will be sharing everything, all those details with us. I'm looking forward to that one. You can register for that program by clicking that link on the bottom there. Again, I will send out all this information via email. Uh, let's see here. What else? Oh, another great website um, for resources related to um, not only just Pearl Harbor, but Wake Island, Guam, the Philippines is infamydecember1941.org. It's actually a website that we made uh, five years ago for the 70th anniversary of all these attacks, but uh, still has some really relevant and interesting information. And also... Uh, some really great interactive maps as well. Of course, you can buy Pearl Harbor merchandise here in the museum store, link below. And, um, and we have a tour going to Hawaii and now starting in less than a month. So uh, you can find out even more information on that. So those are all the kind of closing reminders I have for you all. Please join us to watch the live stream of the commemoration on the 7th. 
Please then again join us on the 8th for another webinar that you'll be watching on this platform uh, about Guam, Wake Island, and the Philippines. And I think that's it for me. Uh, I appreciate you all tuning in with us uh, here and uh, spending your hour with us here um, from the museum. Uh, from Captain Jacobs and Chrissy here at the World War II Museum, everyone have a great day. Bye-bye.